So hi everyone, this is Jyotsna Hegde with NRI Pulse. Today we have with us Bob Arnimali, who is running for City Council, Johns Creek, Post 3. So hi, Mr. Arnimali, good morning. Hello, Dr. Shamala, good morning. Good morning, Jyotsna. Hi. <laughs> so Mr. Arnimali, you have such an illustrious and you know a very uh, high-ranging career you know uh, you've been and you've served in the Indian Air Force you know you are a second lieutenant here so please tell us about your journey. I, in my previous life I was a major or a squad leader in the Indian Air Force yes uh, that was an exciting profession uh, of course it's also very least forgiving because we don't have the option to park my plane and then get it repaired once it's in the air. So notwithstanding it, uh, one of the things Air Force trains you is, Air Force as a service trains you is, if you find a hole, fix it, or you will fall in it. If I can just tell you a brief story, you know, the reason, a uh, lot of people ask me this question, why are you running? Uh, That's gonna be my next public... question, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> a lot of people ask me this question. They are probably not used to seeing somebody from our part of the neck of the woods to run for public office. But here's my question, you know, when, uh, as I said, in the Air Force, one day I was going on my bike and there was a, I was an officer in the Indian Air Force. There was another person who was not an officer who kind of, when I passed by him, he's supposed to salute. He didn't for some reason salute me. And I kind of ignored it because I had a, I was my, somebody, I was my, flight was waiting to depart, meaning I had to go there and fly the plane. Uh, but my commanding officer was on the second floor and he saw the entire episode. And he said, forget about the flying, come to my office. And when I went there, he, he told me, I saw you ignore that person's violation of the law. When he doesn't salute you, he violates the law. And it's not just he's violating the law. He's disrespecting the flag you represent. For him, you represent the authority which is given to you by the president of India. And then he quoted, listen, if on the, if on a, nothing is happening on the street, he's going by and he's ignoring you. Do you think you'll be able to command him to work when the bombs are raining to service your airplane? That integrity has to be built now on the street. And he said, listen, I'll be gone in about 10 years. You'll inherit this Air Force. This is what you will be inheriting. So that message really kind of stuck in me, even though he didn't kind of, he was not very forceful, but it was like that soft snow which sticks on the ground. Yeah. That message has been there for a long time. So if I find a hole, I'm kind of compelled to fix it. Fix it. Or I fall in it, I inherit it that problem. So this was one thing which I found in the city. There are some issues which need to be addressed. Some are priorities, some are not, but some really compel you to take action. So what, uh, so, okay, so in that case, what are your priorities for John Creek? Yeah, my priorities, you know, uh, instantly, there are four priorities which possibly, you know, local to John's Creek, but some of them are local to the region and some of them have got slightly larger ramifications. Let's put it this way, public safety. You know, two weeks ago, I was in a meeting where North Fulton Mayor's Association was meeting in John's Creek. So there, I went and asked the mayor of either Sandy Spring or Roswell. I asked him, how are you finding the police retention? the police personnel retention, because a lot of people in Atlanta, about 400 people have quit the force and they're not re-signed it. And that is why there are a fair amount of deterioration in the law and order, as we all have heard in the city of Atlanta. So much so, this mayor was telling that even the homeless people are migrating out of Atlanta. <laughs> one, would, one would find it very funny, but the mayor said, yeah, they also want to live. Don't want to get randomly shot. The same thing, you know, if you go further up, most of the time, north of the Chattahoochee, you find relatively very peaceful. 
people are very safe. John Street was voted the number one safest city in Georgia for a lot, years in running. And what would happen if that were to be compromised? The point is, the cops can come five minutes after the burglary is being done. They don't have to prosecute anybody. They don't have to arrest anybody. They're safe. You're the one who's losing. You're the one who is losing. So the point is, if the cops turn a blind eye, we don't want to do that primarily because they seem to be under some kind of extra scrutiny. So as a city council, you have to strive for a balance. You need public accountability as well as law and order effectiveness. So that is one of the main reasons which I feel. And also, you know, last year, there was a youth in John Street High School who overdosed on methamphetines. Now, that is a concern. If drugs were to come up north, that is where most of our kids are. We don't need a concentrated effort for our kids to go down that path. You just need one bad friend. You know, as they say, you know, friends are like buttons on an elevator. Some yeah. take you up, some take you down. Right? You just need to meet, if I, my kid were to meet somebody, that kind of person, you know, that is a real horror story unfolding. Uh, and I think the whole family will be affected. So that is something which is very, very right front and center in my mind. So I want to make sure that law enforcement, respect for law enforcement is implemented while allowing them to train, allowing them to be more effective, have good inter interactions with the civilian community so that they are effective. Basically, there are no transgressions. At the same time, they are effective as a police force. That is number one. There are a couple of local things like, you know, we are building a town center. Town center is a huge project, multi-million dollar project. Just the Arts Council in Johns Creek is billing at about 55 million, 55 to 60 million. Now, here is something. Uh, I feel I've been a small businessman for about 16 years. I believe that if we have a budget, we need to monitor it and constantly check if it is staying within the guardrails. Otherwise, it will become like an 800-pound gorilla with a ravenous appetite for our dollars. And that's uh, number two. And also, you know, Johns Creek and generally this area is very green. We, need, we have a lot of sidewalks. We have a lot of parks. We also need to see that those projects are implemented in a timely fashion, not extended to, there are, there's some kind of paralysis that sets in through extensive analysis. At some point, you have to take action. So those are a couple of things. And, and uh, I would also think, you know, I don't know how familiar we are with this topic. Most of the Northern Atlanta region suffers from erosion of soil whenever there's rains. In my house- Stormwater, right? Yeah. Yeah, stormwater is such an issue for us. Yeah. And it bad because uh, the, the erosion is such a severe problem yes. that trees tend to topple off yeah. and fall on properties, cause destruction. And, you know, that is needless, something which you can avoid. And most of the time, you know, it is gravity. It's not somebody's uh, malintention that they are running water down the streets. Yeah. But the net result is people who are at the lower levels often face the consequence. I used to be a HOA president. Every time, if you tell my residents, we need to cough up a little more for stormwater measures, it is, uh, it is, it hits their pocketbooks. So that's something which we need to, they already, the one thing good is, John Street has already attempted to aim in this. They've taken a first step, but we need to ensure that this is equitable and just to everybody. So that's something very important. And also, John Street, uh, we have this terrific jewel of an institution in our John Street called uh, Emory John Street. Excuse me about that. So Emory John Street is so centrally located that all the hospitals are about five, seven miles away. So we actually form a kind of a, we are right in the center where Duluth is on one side, Alfred is on one side, coming is to the north. So we can be a healthcare destination too. So that is something which I find, you know, and great possibility that we can build build John Street. In 2017, it was built as the healthiest city in Georgia. So I think we should, it's a laudable 
aspiration to regain that. And being my wife being associated with uh, healthcare, me in a very oblique way being associated with healthcare, I feel that uh, I do have certain understanding to bring this to fruition. So these are a few uh, instances which also makes uh, my foray into politics a little imperative. Uh, apart from this, you know, when when uh, when I said I was a second lieutenant in the civil air patrol, that is one way I feel I am giving back to the society. You know, we all we all come to this country. Initial few years we relish what America has done. <laughs> Right? And slowly when we transition into our jobs and businesses, we unconsciously become part of a nation building. My journey into public service is a similar reflection of what a collective journey is, only it is a little more manifest, visible. And uh, towards that, you know, I feel that we need to take care of the community and the city at large. To give you an example, you know, I run a youth foundation, mentoring foundation. As I said, you know, in that high school, a youth needs to just misstep once. Afterwards, it's, it's a very difficult spiral to get out, right? So when this, this uh, high school foundation is called I Rose Up, and what we do is we basically get high schoolers and make them get some enriching experiences. Like I was talking to the judges and some of the judges agreed to put our children, sit next to them, explain them the law, and consult with them when they are sentenced. Wow. Yeah. So those are the kind of experiences I want the kids to have. Like we also thought of taking them to MARTA operations. Then all this got stumped because of COVID. We didn't want to gather and congregate, uh, safety being such an important thing to parents. So that is one thing. But you realize in three years, I touched just about 80 lives. You know, three years, it took 80 lives. But that's where I thought, you know, maybe if I step up, I can possibly touch a lot more people and prevent, you know, most importantly, prevent. It's always firefighting is an essential service. But to rescue them from once they take the mistake is, I think, something we can do better than that. Prevent it by giving them alternate experiences, saying that, you know, hey, you don't just need to go down that path. Let their brain be occupied by good thoughts. It's like having a lawn. You can, if you let it go to seed, weeds will grow. But if you take, as parents, we take conscious efforts to plant nice flowers in them. And so that they become very productive citizens and somebody whom we all are proud of. So these are few reasons why I am trying to run for the office. Point is, I need to give back to this community. It's this community has given us, I mean, all of us, the Indian community is one of the richest minority in this nation. At some point, we need to possibly give back to this, engage more actively in the nation building process. Um, so, Mr. Bob and, uh, you know, Dr. Shamla, you can chime in too. What is the best part about uh, living in Johns Creek? What is the, what is the one thing that you guys uh, love the most about being here in Johns Creek? So, um, thank you for giving this opportunity just now. Uh, I would like to share a few of the things. Johns Creek, we have a couple of office locations that is uh, um, looking at the business point. Uh, so we are kind of, we want to choose a place where it is in the middle of the two offices, so the commute would be easier. And second one is the safety, and uh, very safe. Uh, we love these parks and all, we wish we could have more and go for walking and all. Um, so that's the best thing, this is the best city. In Georgia. That's why we chose. <laughs> go, go John's Creek. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a hopeless romantic. It's like this. Whenever I cross Gunnet into John's Creek, I almost hear the birds chirping, the temperature dropping, becoming cooler. I just <laughs> only have a great mood, a smile on my lips. Hopefully, the music is playing. So, both of we have situated our houses on the banks of Chattahoochee, the backside. So, we really enjoy the nature. 
So what, uh, according to you, is the biggest issue that, you know, uh, Johns Creek faces and uh, how would you sort of address that issue? I think uh, my particular concern is, as I said, public safety is number one in my mind. I, I do not want it to slide back. What happens is, as I said, if the police ever get, see, the police officers are just somebody like us. You know, being in the military, for me, it's very instinctive that I respect authority. Because most of the time it saved my life. And in the city, authority, prime, prime FSE evidence of authority is the police. And I don't have an adversarial relationship with them. I've been stopped a few times. And all the time they've been very courteous to me. I'm sure there are some occasions it is that uh, interaction would not go, could, could have been better. But the point is, that's exactly what these people are doing now. There's so much of training which is happening in John Street Police Department. And if I would were to be there on that board, I feel that that training will play a lot of uh, pivotal role in ensuring public has adequate trust in the force. It is very critical that it's a handshake. The public cooperation is so critical for police to be effective. And we are vice versa. If the police is effective, then the public has more confidence in them. If there is some missteps from the police, the public loses confidence. So therefore, as a city council person, I have to see that there's a nice marriage between these two. And basically, I find, you know, it's very easy to have knee-jerk reaction and, you know, haul the police for small infractions. Yes, if they are, I feel it's like this, you know, if you have a stock portfolio of 20 stocks, if one stock does bad, you don't sell the whole 20. If there's one person who's egregiously uh, behaving, number one, we have to take care of that and then address the root problem. Is it that is this folks, are these folks adequately trained to handle a community which is so diverse, right? Because some, some of the cultural differences do play up as uh, suspicious behavior. By, by nature, if our parents were to come to this city, they're very curious what's happening here. They probably peek in here, that garage, while they're walking on there. And when somebody is talking to them, and you also will agree, when we come to this country, people think that we know English and others understand our English. <laughs> right? They don't know that what we speak when we are fresh out of the boat, nobody can understand. <laughs> so the point is, there's a gap there. If somebody calls on our old parents, come somebody like that, it's very easy to things to go to go south pretty quickly. So that's where I feel some kind of cultural training, some kind of cultural handshake. That's good. Yeah, exactly. When we are doing these religious sermon ceremonies. Uh, just to tell do you do know that I was the president of Sai Baba Temple. One of the main things I used to encourage the police officers from coming is to come and actually have get involved in some of the local festivities, like Holi. We couldn't spray color on them, but but they understood. <laughs> hey, what is the idea? What is the idea behind the festival? So the, those people are they also understand, hey, they don't mean some harm to you by just putting a tikka on your forehead. And those are the kind of things. That's what I feel very strongly about. We need to get some kind of sensitive. But by the same token, I have immense respect for police and fire. And I believe if we are living in a very civilized place, the difference between Afghanistan as it is now versus John Street or America is the law and order here. And these are the people who are the, are the front face of facing the authority of this nation. Law enforcement. Yeah, you were talking about diversity. Uh, so, um, Mr. Bo, what, what do you think? Uh, how do you think you know diversity has sort of contributed, you know, uh, to the growth of Johns Creek? What do you think is the contribution? Wonderful. <laughs> you know, there's um, you know there's a body called Arts Council in Johns Creek. There are four Indian members on that. Really? Starting with the treasurer. So the point is, our Indian people. I would say people from South Asia and our immigrants are, you know, I, I, I don't kind of, uh, I also see when, when I see whether it is white people, Koreans, Asians, Chinese, Indians, I feel it's, it's good that as a community that we are getting engaged in this process. See, what is Italy known for? But for Michelangelo, Da Vinci and the Botticelli's, 
see the arts is such a huge uh, player and I then, see it right behind us <laughs> <laughs> thank you so i i i think arts plays a great role in integrating us next thing is arts also immemorializes right our society in this place and i guess uh, we should be we should be really we should be ready to accept the diversity and oh, yeah your question was how is diversity enriching this chapter right two three weeks ago when i looked at i think this is not a surprise for you three weeks ago when i saw the john fig carol in chatterhoji high school top two people are indians in john fig high school top two people are chinese so my point is when i'm running also i keep this in back of mind why shouldn't smart people like these come into public policy and deliver an exceptional service to this country usa didn't become a world champ by having mediocre people running it public policy so that's what uh, one of the main reason i feel it's a great strength that such diversity exists in transport So, Mr. Nimali, um, you know there is a huge traffic problem in Johns Creek, as we all know. So, um, do you have any ways to address that issue? Yes. Um, one of the things which we notice is uh, Peachtree Corners, which is in Gwinnett, and Cumming, which is in Forsyth. They at, have the stretches of forty-five miles per hour. For us, we have the same lanes, little wider lanes, but we have a speed limit of fifty-five. So people transit faster to us. recently the one of the busiest intersection we have in uh, john creek is straight bridge and 141 medlock bridge the regal cinema they they just put in about 2.5 million dollars to restrike the road so that the turn lanes are a little faster because most of the time turn lanes choke up the traffic coming behind so the, they have showed some improvement there you know uh, i believe there is more in line unfortunate part of the traffic is the lights stripes are controlled by city but the road itself is controlled by the g dot so ideally we would like to have a wider road but it comes with its own set of problems so the point is we from our side are trying to move the traffic faster by having smoother intersections we we can do a little better job in coordinating the lights but i guess we are now at about at least i would say about 90 92% efficiency in terms of coordinating the lights so that if you come at a particular speed you do not stop at very many lights there's another thing which i need to mention we say we are neighbors i think one of the reason as a city council person is you set the tone for cooperation between cities if you are coming from alfreda into john street if you notice the there are only two lane road and most of the time in the evening you have the choke points here once you step into john street it is widens up and it becomes three lane and you have these turn lanes into various communities and all that which actually take up some traffic so it traffic does move faster i am on state bridge i used to face this a major issue but not anymore they put lights they coordinated it one of the thing which is in their favor is because of covid the traffic has reduced people are working from home so the rubber will meet the road at some point down the a few more years to go where people slowly start coming out and you know i don't know whether it's a reversible trend working from home versus working from office but i presume when the traffic really catches up that's certainly a time when we can see how effective these measures were at this point they seem to be effective because the traffic is little thin especially in jaspur thank you uh one of the major issues you know we are having uh, these days you know is uh, you know the uh, sort of this controversy between mask mandates and you know vaccinations so um as someone who is running for council what is your stand on you know uh, what's going on with the schools and you know and this kind of uh, mandates yeah i understand you see mask as well as vaccination both are topics which are which need lot of medical medically correct advice you know the other day some there's a little joke somebody told me 
some some guy went to a doctor and said hey how long do you think this uh, covid is going to last he said i don't know come on you're a doctor so that guy said i'm a doctor i'm not a politician <laughs> so, so we politicians can possibly make uh, you know statements which uh, are categorically wrong or right but i believe if they're based on science i think that is a safe bet i personally feel i would rather talk to a pediatrician who's uh, before i say anything this way or that way for children going to school because children you can't stop children from congregating you can't children stop children from uh, getting mixing up very very intimately and yes they can come back and carry the infection at that point if the parents are not vaccinated there is a chance it will be a little more harder on them than patients who are vaccinated parents so my particular thing if i were to say that i would say personally i had vaccinated in february as i had no adverse effects and i had gone to india i was in the month of april i was in india and i was exposed to delta variant seven times they did the pcr test on me all seven times i came back wow for me i i i take great comfort in the fact that this vaccine saved me so many times so i can tell by personal example but vaccines is something i don't feel comfortable mandating it primarily because we are all grown up and uh, we do have especially in georgia we have some control over this people are and i can say in john street people are lot more careful because we got a lot of outdoors lot of and uh, going by the rule i feel that you know i rather tell them the benefits tell them the idea rather than ma- you know the point of mandates when you have a mandate that means somebody has to enforce it mm. think about that how how difficult how, that situation instantly gets out of hand how many children can you go start citing will you cite the we can't cite the children we can't cite the parents parents have no control what happens once you go to school so the point is have a policy which is implementable my point is therefore if you just mandate one way or the other if the guy is driving alone in a car you mandate a mask mandate how many people can you catch the police is one of the thing which why i feel very strongly the police the respect for authority means fewer people will commit the crime but now masking and all that johnstick is a city of almost 90000 a very very big city so the point is if out of these 90000 even 1000 people start disobeying the law if you mandate it becomes a disobedience so therefore the police will be putting themselves in these trivial situations rather than addressing true crimes and needless to say that also will have a lot of repercussions in the sense you know one thing leads to other and there is so much of fire fighting to be done afterwards i believe therefore if the city is engaged in the process of informing people that will be a lot more effective cost effective and also you know you don't waste your equity on that whatever the city most people feel in johnstick the city is doing a fairly good job and if you keep doing things which which are irritating them all the time uh, it it you are whatever thing you built up over the years slowly will erode surely and steadily so you were talking about uh, so how would you sort of engage the public uh, in in you know in the city's uh, decisions is that something that you're uh, open to to have more public involvement absolutely the st- the see right now i'm doing it when i said that was in april i was in india i was exposed seven times and seven times my test came negative in april the cases had already spiked to 150000 true in delhi so the point is we know it works we know it works of course i i am not i'm a layman as much as possibly you are we don't know the far reaching consequences of a vaccine i don't want but at this point it it definitely is this is the a very effective way of combating the virus and more importantly i feel that this is a quick way of getting back our economy getting back our lives getting back our sanity 
it, I'm sure you have seen some of your friends after a year or two, I mean, year, year and a half, because of all these lockdowns and self-imposed exercise. So towards that, I would advocate in the sense, there's some certain definite benefits to taking that. There, that is undeniable. So finally, so why should the people of Johns Creek vote for you? Oh, good. Why should they? <laughs> okay, here's one reason. Number one is one of the things that you learn in Air Force is you learn to act. You can't choose your problems. You can't choose when to act on the problems. Right? You have to do it appropriately at the same time. I can't control the weather. I just adapt. So all the time, these three intangibles always play into my psyche, wherever I approach. And more importantly, they always tell you, okay, you finish the mission now, be ready tomorrow. So whether that statement is be ready tomorrow means be prepared for tomorrow's consequences. The next time when we, that's why when I came to this country, I was so easily, I transitioned into a software engineer. I started working for Fortune 500 companies like IBM, Lockheed, American Express and so and so. Thereafter, when we opened our second clinic and my wife asked me, why did you come and help me? I transitioned there again. So there was another transition. But for the last 16 years, we have been living within a budget. We learned to plan, learn to anticipate I mean, unexpected surprises and cater for them. So these are a couple of, couple of intangible qualities which we have gone through for the last few, many, possibly decades, couple of decades. So those are the things which help me in tackling the problems which currently are besetting John's Creek. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bob. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shamala, and we wish you all the very best. I hope you get elected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for talking to NRI Advance.